All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for attending this uh, tax forum, the spring tax forum this morning. Um, I appreciate you all being here. It's exciting to see uh, we still are getting some more participants joining, but it's exciting to see a lot of familiar names and a lot of new names to me also on the participants list. So welcome. Appreciate you all joining us. Uh, my name is Dan Durst. I'm a partner in the tax section here, also in the private client fiduciary services practice here at Williams Mullen. And I'm joined today by my tax section colleague, Kyle Wingfield, and we're based, we're both based out of the Richmond office. Before we begin our program, and I'm hoping I don't run into any technical difficulties here, I'm sharing the screen. Um, here we go. All right. Um, before we begin our program, I have a few housekeeping items. Um, at any point during the presentation, you may submit questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will address questions as time permits. If we don't get to your particular question during the webinar, we will follow up with you afterwards. Also, if you are having any audio or technical problems, please use that same Q&A button and we will help to resolve uh, whatever problem you're, ha you're having. Uh, this program has been approved for one credit hour of CPE credit and our application for one hour of CFP credit is pending. This afternoon, you'll receive an email with the certificate of attendance for CPE and we'll send a separate email when our CFP credit has been approved. So for today's program, Kyle will kick us off with pass-through entity guidance, and then I will cover some SECURE Act updates relating to retirement plans. So with that, let's get started, and I'll turn the time over now to Kyle for his presentation. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, uh, hello to everybody out there, and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the Virginia pass-through entity tax uh, guidance, and uh, then more generally uh, pass-through entity tax uh, elections in other states as well. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So I think by now everybody is pretty familiar with the $10,000 salt cap limitation. Uh, it was introduced in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017, amended section 164, to limit the deduction that individuals can take for state and local taxes to $10,000, $5,000 for married individuals, individuals filing separately beginning in tax year, tax years after December 31, 2017 and before January 1, 2026. Uh, obviously, you know, many, many states, many taxpayers were unhappy about this. So states began passing workarounds. One of the first ones that I'll mention was uh, legislation by some, some states allowing taxpayers to pay their tax liability to a charitable fund in exchange for tax credits. Taxpayers could then uh, claim a charitable tax deduction on their federal return and bypass the $10,000 limitation. Um, that was shot down in June of 2019 when the IRS and Treasury issued final regulations. Um, uh, it was uh, under the quid pro quo doctrine. Any, any uh, state tax benefit that you get reduces your federal benefit, and uh, it had ripple effects into other areas as well, like charitable conservation easements and whatnot. But um, uh, so the next the next strategy uh, proved to be uh, more successful. States started passing legislation allowing pass-through entities, partnerships, and S corporations to make an election and pay the tax at the entity level, uh, and then thereby allowing their members or shareholders to um, deduct their federal the, the federal taxes on on their on their federal income tax return this this strategy was in fact blessed by the the irs in notice 2020-75 in november 2020 and uh since then it's kind of been off to the races with states passing legislation uh for pass-through entity taxes so um next slide please uh, most of the states that have enacted the uh, the um the pastor any tax election or legislation have fallen into one of three groups. Uh, option or group one allows pastor members to reduce their adjusted gross income by their pro rata share of income from the pastor entity if the PTE makes an election. Uh, group one states include Arkansas, Colorado, Georgia, North Carolina, New Mexico, and the other states listed here. Uh, group two uh, is a little, takes a, a little bit different approach. Uh, they allow uh, pass-through members to take a credit to offset their taxable income 
Uh, members still have to report their full distributive share of income on their tax return, but then uh, they get a credit for it. And some states like Virginia, we'll get to in a minute, um, they, they, they offer a, a full refundable uh, credit. Other states like California uh, doesn't offer a fully refundable credit. If you, to the extent that you have any unused credit, you get to carry it forward five years. So there's been some variations uh, in, in all these states in group one and group two. Um, group two states include, include uh, Alabama, Arizona, California, and a bunch of others. And like I said, Virginia. Um, then you have mandatory states. So Connecticut is the uh, only state that's created a mandatory pass-through entity tax, but other jurisdictions like DC, Tennessee, and Texas have historically imposed entity level taxes on pass-through entities as well. So um, next slide, please. So you can see um, as the, um, the the map is getting filled in here, um, we've separated by the group one, group two, and mandatory states. But uh, this has really become the, the hot thing over the last few years. Um, Last time I checked, there were 27 states that had um, enacted some sort of pass-through entity tax election um, or regime. Uh, it felt like this spring every week I was seeing another state get filled in on this map. Uh, that might have cooled off a little bit now. That that legislature seemed to be adjourning for you know the you know the for the for the um, the, the season. But um, we expect that this will continue to be a growing trend. Um, you know. Um, you know, in the next, you know, over the next, you know, you know, year or two, we'll, we'll see more and more of these states uh, enact pass-through entity uh, workarounds. So next slide, please. So getting into Virginia's pass-through entity election um, that was just enacted uh, in here in, in 2022, um, it, it provides that um, it's House Bill uh, 1121 and Senate Bill 692 uh, and provides for taxable years 2021 through 2025 uh, Virginia Code Section 581-390.3 allows a qualifying pastor entity to make an election to pay the tax at the rate of 5.75% at the entity level. And then uh, skipping down to the, to the owner level, each owner will be uh, entitled to cr a credit equal to its pro rata share of tax paid by the qualifying pastor entity. Um, and again, like we said a minute ago, uh, if the amount of credit exceeds a person's tax liability, the excess will be treated as an overpayment and refunded to the owner. Uh, the way that these um, 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 these the, the election works, you don't get the benefit at the state level for any federal deduction. So they make you add that back in. So Virginia, this is purely for Virginia. This is cash in, cash back out. And uh, I, I forget the exact number, but I when I recall looking and seeing what it would cost Virginia to administrate this, and, and it seemed like it was really it was it was really low. Um, and it's really just processing the returns and, and paying them out. I'm, I'm sure the Department of Taxation would tell me there's a lot more to it than that. But but it, that's really it's this is really not costing Virginia anything. It's cash in by the past community, cash out to the owners. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, to show, kind of illustrate the uh, the 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 effect that, that a past community election might have, uh, we've got LLC. It's a Virginia um, limited liability company. All of its assets are here. It sells its assets for $100 million in 2022, and it makes an election and pays the Virginia pasture any tax uh, at the 5.75%. And so because of that, it gets a federal income tax deduction of 5.75 million, 100 million times 5.75. And then we assume the highest federal income um, uh, rate at the owner level of 37%. You might end up getting a capital gain rate or, or you know a lower rate, um, but you know you, we just don't know because you might have recapture and whatnot. So we assume the highest rate, and 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 uh, and calculate that the owners may collectively save roughly two point one million dollars. That's the five point seven five million times the thirty seven percent rate in federal income taxes due to the uh, making the the pass through entity election. So there's some real numbers here um, and and some real uh, potential savings for for folks. Uh, next slide, please. So a qualifying pass-through entity is one that's owned 100% by uh, natural persons, or in the case of a subchapter S corporation, it's owned by people that are eligible to be an owner of an S corporation. Um, the legislation makes no provision for ownership by other PTEs. I've followed up with the Department of Tax, and they say, you know, the, the statute is what it says. So, you know, right now there's, there's no opportunity for um, uh, tiered uh, LLCs, you know, uh, an LLC owning another LLC or ownership by grantor trust even. Um, 
Now, if you have uh, structures here, like I've got a like an LLC that owns another LLC, well, the lower LLC wouldn't be able to make the election uh, because of this rule. But presumably, if the upper tier LLC is owned by folks that are qualifying owners, you know, individuals or S corporation shareholders, then um, that would work. And it's the same thing for an S corporation that owns an LLC. The LLC wouldn't be able to do it, but but perhaps the S corporation could. And it's interesting. Uh, um, in looking at other states, I was recently looking at California. They, they had a similar rule um, up until I believe it was this year where uh, uh, you couldn't have tiered LLCs. Now they allow it, but the, um, so the lower tier LLC can make the election, but the, the upper tier LLC basically doesn't get to participate in, you know, the credit or really any benefit. So, you know, it kind of offsets the benefit of, of making the election. The other thing that I noticed that was interesting about California is, um, um, past unity election too, and I just use this as an example for you know the different flavors you might get in other states, is that um, all of the members of the, the California past unity do not have to make um, to agree to the election. So not everybody has to participate in it, um, uh, which might be the case where if you've got somebody in a state that, that doesn't get a credit for past unity taxes paid in California, that person may not want to participate. Um, the interesting thing in the context of an S corporation is that if you, you make it for some people and then you don't for others, or you try to even it up by distributing cash out to the other S corporation uh, uh, folks or member or shareholders who weren't you know, participating, you, you might end up blowing your S election because you have a second class of stock. So, um, you know, it's the, again, these are just kind of like things that you have to think about when you're, when you're working through this. And Virginia really has not provided us a whole lot of detail yet on the nuts and bolts about how this election is going to work. And that I think will get us into the next slide. Um, so 58.1.390.3 uh, requires uh, Virginia tax to develop requirements and procedures for uh, implementing the pastor entity tax. But by statute, um, they're not required to do it until at least October of 2023. Um, and an important aspect of the if the um, of the Virginia uh, past unity tax, if, if I glazed over it, I'm sorry, is that it's retroactive to tax year 2021. So because this got introduced really in the middle of filing season this year, we didn't really know how this was going to work. So Department of Tax issues this tax bullet in 22-6 and says that, you know, basically everybody um, should file their returns as normal. For 2021, um, if you're a pastor entity, don't try to pay the tax. Now, if you're an owner, don't try to claim a credit for taxes that haven't been paid. Everybody file as normal, and um, then, well, once we issue the, the the forms and procedures, you can, you know, make the election, you know, retroactively uh, as it is. But uh, because this is going to happen in 2023, uh, or maybe you know, hopefully, it would happen earlier, but. When they issue the forms and procedures, you're talking about uh, amending, uh, you know, a state tax return and a federal income tax return, and it will be really interesting. As I, you know, I think a point is, um, it'll be interesting to see how the feds respect an election and a payment in a, in a subsequent year for a prior year, um, you know, for you know, for for making a retroactive election. And and on that note, uh, some of you might have noticed recently that Colorado. Has uh, has passed a, a, a bill that that uh, I believe it's enacted now that would make their pastor in the election retroactive to 2018. Um, surprisingly, so you know you might end up having um, you know closed years for federal taxes, you know, on that. But they would they would allow you to make an electric uh, uh, a retroactive election to 2018. Um, next slide, please. Um, so another important uh, aspect of the Virginia pastor and any tax election is that 58.1-332 um, uh, now allows uh, Virginia taxpayers to claim a, a credit for pastor and any taxes uh, that are substantially similar to Virginia's pastor and any tax that were paid to another state. Uh, previously, in uh, public document 21-156, an administrative ruling denied a credit uh, for Maryland pastor and any tax. Uh, so the the new law overrules uh, the, the the administrative ruling and 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 you get a, a credit in Virginia for 
similar pass-through entity taxes paid to another state. Uh, that does not include franchise, business, uh, privilege, license, you know, occupation taxes. So, um, you know, in some states that have those, like, you know, a franchise tax, that would have to be, uh, you'd have to look into that. Next slide, please. Um, so there's some unanswered questions uh, for 2022. Well, for 2022 and future years, uh, the election should be pretty straightforward once they issue the guidance. Uh, the, the kind of uncertainty is how are they gonna implement this for 2021? So I've listed a, a few items here that, that you need uh, or worth thinking about, I believe. And uh, that's if a pastor entity, uh, a PTE sold assets in 2021, It'll need to have enough cash on hand to make the election and pay the entity level taxes in 2023. Now that's unless Virginia somehow gives a credit to um, for the, the taxes that the individual owners might have paid on their returns for 2021. But uh, just thinking about how they would do that gives me a headache and I would imagine to be administratively burdensome for the department. So it'll be interesting to see how they make that um, work. Um, similarly, if a, if a in, in 2021, if the pastor entity already made a tax uh, distribution, then the owners might have to put cash back into the entity uh, in order to pay the pastor entity tax. And uh, distributions might need to be treated as regular distributions for 2021 uh, once the election is made instead of tax distributions. Um, it's also uncertainty for, for businesses that sold and liquidated in 2021. How do, you, how do you put it back together now and resurrect it so that they can make the election when the company is is dissolved and, and, and uh, liquidated. Um, and then there's another issue that, that um, I think will be interesting too, is that you know if it's for 2021, the department is saying you gotta file your return and pay your taxes as normal, then the owners have, have paid their taxes or, or will pay them by you know, this in October on the past year entity. Um, but then if the entity itself has to, has to make the election and pay the tax, you could have the situation where both the individual owners and the and the entity have paid the tax, um, and there's some kind of lag time between then and when the department will refund you the money for the, the owner, the money for that that they have paid. So it, that that could be a timing issue to, to watch out for. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so other observations that that we've seen are allocation and apportionment issues uh, with uh, operations in multiple states. Those need to be studied based on the past or any election uh, uh, regimes in, in, in the other states. And um, I would suggest that anytime you have a, a past or entity uh, that's, that's, that's being sold or any kind of M&A work on it, uh, that, that all this stuff needs to be studied very carefully because these laws are uh, even even the the the, the ones that, that have had pastor the elections on the books now for a couple of years, like California, they just recently changed theirs, you know, allowing a tiered LLC essentially make it. Um, then the other thing to watch out for is that many uh, members may or shareholders may live in states that do not give a credit for past entity taxes paid to another state. So um, that needs to be studied carefully too when a um, tax matter, when a, when a past unity of tax matters uh, partner or uh, manager is deciding whether to make the election, they have to consider that not everybody, you know, if they have non-resident members are, is going to be able to get this past unity tax or, or potentially not everybody will be able to get it. Um, so that's one thing to consider. But then on the other hand, you know, you know, a, a counter argument to that is that you're reducing federal, you know, taxable income and that might, you know, partially offset uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 non-resident having to pay tax in his state on or her state on, on the income. So um, that's something to consider as well. Uh, at least in Virginia, pastor entities have typically filed uh, composite returns for their non-resident members so that they don't have to, the individual owners don't have to file Virginia income tax returns. Um, and uh, But now with this election and this credit, uh, it'll drag more people into filing in Virginia. Um, they'll have to file now in order to claim the credit. And, uh, you know, since they're filing in, in Virginia, it could, you know, they're, they're reporting their income, it could open them up to additional audit exposure too. But uh, I would imagine the, the benefit, um, like we saw in the example, might outweigh, um, you know, potential risk in that regard. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some you know considerations. I uh, have to plug the accountants and lawyers here. Anytime you do want a pastor entity, uh, you might want to recommend you talking to your to your uh, uh, accountant or your lawyer. Uh, we 
as we were uh, mentioning a minute ago. Uh, again, hold cash and reserves to make the election, at least in Virginia, and pay tax in 20, for 2021. Um, again, tax matters man manager or partner should consider the impact of making the election on any non-Virginia uh, resident owner. And uh, importantly, things you can do now are uh, review your operating agreement, your shareholder agreements, make sure the tax language uh, distribution um, distribution language uh, is, is, is good so that any past or any election taxes paid towards that are treated as a, as a distribution. Um, you know, adjusting capital accounts, make sure the right decision makers are involved in uh, who can make the election, whether it's just the, the, the uh, tax manager's manager or partner, or if you have to, uh, you, you want to have like a larger group, like other partners kind of like make the, you know, consent to making the election. So those are things to, to, uh, to think about um, uh, now before you know, you get to a situation, particularly with a sale that you wanna make an election. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then I've just put some, uh, some other um, um, uh, questions here when, when reviewing the, the elections in other states. Um, first, when must the election be made? Is the election, is the election binding or annual? Um, can it be revoked? Uh, how do you make it? Uh, at least in Virginia, that's still a big question mark. And so, uh, uh, stay tuned there. Um, who's authorized to make the election? We've discussed that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Is the election uh, available to tiered partnerships uh, or um, uh, uh, members who are not individuals? Um, are non-resident members of electing PTE still required to file returns? Um, in Virginia, it would be yes. How do you, the members report their share of income? And does the state allow a credit for past year and any taxes paid to another state? Uh, those are some of the questions you'd ask. And then, I, I mean, I, I, like in the broader context and like in like an M&A deal, you know, we've seen, um, you know, you know, where it's trying to make a decision between a 338H10 uh, or an equity uh, sale of, you know, equity, um, you know, it's, you know, so it's an asset or a stock sale, you know, the, the, the benefits of, uh, of, of making an asset election uh, can, can be great. Um, in the in the MA context, you know, because of this past year unity election, um, the H10 doesn't provide any provide any opportunity really for um, uh, rollover equity, but you could do an F reorganization um, that that essentially takes an S corporation, creates a new holding company, makes an S election for that, drops the old S corp down, and makes a Q sub election, converts it to an LLC, and you can sell part of the interest of the LLC, so you get the benefit of an asset. Um, uh, sale uh, and, and you for for tax purposes in the PTE election, and you might be able to, to retain some 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 qualified or some uh, some uh, equity rollover in it so to to defer some of the taxes. So there there are lots of planning opportunities here. I, I bring that that up, which um, sorry I'm I'm running late, so I'm kind of rushing through that. But uh, just to 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 point out that when you have these these uh, partnerships, LLCs, past year entities. Uh, in an M and A deal, it's important to maybe look at different strategies where you might be able to, to make the election in order to to save your your clients some work, uh, some some money. So um, thank you for your time today, and uh, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kyle. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, and I see there is one, Kyle, in the question Q and A uh, link there. But if you have questions for Kyle. Uh, on his program, please go ahead and submit them using the Q&A button there on Zoom. Um, and we'll try to get to all the questions we can at the end of the program. Uh, if we don't have time again, as a reminder, we'll follow up after the program. So we're gonna switch gears now. Um, I'm gonna talk about the SECURE Act and give some updates about it. Um, I only have about 20 or 25 minutes to review. Um, if you guys are all familiar with the retirement uh, with, with Section 401 of the code. It's a very technical statute. Uh, these are very technical proposed regulations that we've had recently, and I don't have a whole lot of time to cover it. So I'm only I'm going to have to assume that we have a basic background of, uh, of rules relating to retirement plans. Um, I won't get to start at first principles like I usually like to do in a program. Um, I'm going to focus on the proposed rules relating to required minimum distributions for 401k plans and IRAs. Um, and so first I'll start with sort of the basic changes of the SECURE Act, then I'll go over the clarifications or maybe even the obfuscations made in the recently proposed regulations. And then if time permits, 
I'll discuss briefly the new Secure Act 2.0 bill that's working its way through Congress. Uh, and hopefully my goal is that, you know, 20 to 25 minutes from now, you'll all know kind of the most critical or commonly occurring issues covered by the proposed regulations. So technically also, I'm gonna limit my comments today or the discussion to um, 401k plans and IRAs. So when I refer to retirement plans in this presentation, please just keep that in mind. Uh, uh, pensions might have slightly different uh, rules under the code and under these regs. Um, so just we're talking about 401k plans and IRAs since I've got limited time, I wanted to focus on the most common situations. So as a reminder, the SECURE Act was made law on December 20th of 2019 and its rules apply to retirement plan accounts with owners who die on or after January 1st, 2020 and retirement plan accounts with owners who died before January 1st, 2020, but with an original designated beneficiary who then dies on or after January 1st of 2020. Um, the required beginning date or RBD is the, is the abbreviation that you'll hear here and elsewhere. That's the date when the owner of the retirement plan account must begin taking required minimum distributions or RMDs. So RBD, required beginning date and RMD, required minimum distribution. The SECURE Act increased the age at which RMDs generally must be, begin from 70 and a half to 72. So if you're born on or after July 1st of 1949, you get to wait up to two years longer before beginning to take RMDs. So that means that younger account owners get to defer paying income taxes just a little bit longer. If a retirement plan account owner dies and has, has designated an individual beneficiary, the SECURE Act um, has in many, if not most instances, instances, limited the period of time over which the account must be distributed to 10 years. Before the SECURE Act, as you'll recall, most individual beneficiaries could draw down an account over the length of their, act, their entire actuarial life expectancy. So now most beneficiaries have to finish taking out all the retirement plan assets and generally paying income tax on those assets within about 10 years of the death of the original retirement plan account owner or the original designated beneficiary. The change to the um, required beginning date and the 10 year limit on a beneficiary's payout of an, entire, of an inherited retirement plan account were arguably the two biggest or most impactful changes of the SECURE Act. Then the SECURE Act created five categories of beneficiaries that can still use their actuarial life expectancy to calculate their required minimum distributions. Uh, those categories are the surviving spouse, children under the age of majority, disabled individuals, chronically ill individuals, and individuals who are not more than 10 years younger than the account owner. So just to be clear, a spouse named as the outright beneficiary can still do a spousal rollover into their own account. So these uh, five though, groups of individuals uh, are called eligible designated beneficiaries. So sometimes you see people call these people EDBs. Um, the SECURE Act didn't change the rules relating to who can qualify as a designated beneficiary or just a DB, so an ineligible designated beneficiary, somebody not on this list, but who is still a, an identifiable individual. Basically only identifiable individuals and see-through trusts can be designated beneficiaries. Uh, but they're not necessarily eligible designated beneficiaries. And the SECURE Act didn't change the distribution requirements when a beneficiary is not a designa designated beneficiary, like an estate or charity. So that um, concludes the, the, the refresher portion of my presentation about the SECURE Act generally. Now let's talk about the proposed regulations. So there were proposed regulations released on February 23rd of this year. And the next step in the rulemaking process is the comment period where members of the public get to give their two cents on the proposed regulations. And the comment period actually closed yesterday, May 25th. So next there will be a public hearing, uh, which should be on June 15th. And then eventually the treasury will release or issue final regulations, which might or might not take into consideration some of the comments. You know, they might look like the proposed regulations or there might be some changes. So first um, I'm going to, cover what I consider to be the most critical part uh, or parts of the regulations and then my favorite part of the proposed regulations personally. So perhaps the biggest surprise um, of the proposed regulations is what they say about distributions that must be made within a 10-year period 
after the account owner's death. Most people believed that the new 10-year rule would be similar to the longstanding five-year rule. So the five-year rule for certain situations requires all of the funds to be distributed within a five-year period, but without requiring any particular distributions before the end of year five. So you could defer all of your distributions until the very end of year five, if that's what you chose. The proposed regulations clarify that that's not the rule with respect to the 10-year period for certain and very common situations under the SECURE Act. So um, just to be really clear about this, this is a situation where if the owner dies after their RBD, so after they are 70 and a half or 72, whatever their RBD is, or um, in certain, certain instances, the RBD can even be uh, deferred on 401ks if the person hasn't retired yet. But if the owner dies after their RBD, the proposed regulations require minimum distributions based on the life expectancy of their designated beneficiary in each year during the 10 year period. Uh, but everything must then be distributed by the end of the 10th year. So that's probably the biggest news of the proposed regulations and will affect the most beneficiaries. So I've got that at the top of the list. That's the, uh, I think uh, the big thing that needs to be taken away from uh, the proposed regulations. Um, they, they don't require that. The, do, the regulations don't appear to require that for somebody who has died before their RBD uh, and has a designated beneficiary. There's still a 10-year requirement, but they read as though uh, the, the distributions can be deferred until the end of the 10-year period. And it gets to what the statute says. The statute basically says in the instance of somebody who dies after their RBD that the account has to be distributed uh, over a period that's no longer than the period that applied to the owner which would have been their uh, life expectancy. Um, there was a hint that this could be the final rule in an initial draft of IRS publication 590B that was issued in March of last year. Um, IRS publication 590B is about uh, retirement accounts and how to take distributions. Uh, and it's written in a very uh, taxpayer friendly, at least as far as uh, IRS publications go, uh, it's written in a friendly way. So I, I would refer you to that uh, also for for further guidance on how to make these distributions. But the IRS then issued, after they issued the one in March of last year, they issued a corrected one in May of last year and they changed an example and they expressly provided that no distributions needed to be taken in years one through nine. Um, so now we have this proposed regulation which says something different in instances where somebody has died after their RBD. Um, so I'm sure, and I've seen some of the comments, some people I'm sure are gonna give comments that uh, the 10-year rule ought to allow deferral until the 10th year. I've actually seen uh, comments from the public that say that we should be requiring distributions every year during the 10 years so that nobody gets caught with a huge distribution and a huge tax in year 10, which, you know, some people might think is paternalistic. But um, anyhow, you see comments about this on both sides. So we'll see what they decide in the final regulations on that point. My personal favorite part of the proposed regulations, it's a clarification on the rules of how to identify the people who count as, uh, as designated beneficiaries when the designated beneficiary is a trust. So the proposed regulations identify two kinds of trusts that can qualify as see-through trusts where you can see through the trust to identify the designated beneficiary. The two kinds of trusts are what are called conduit trusts and accumulation trusts. And those two terms have been making their way around the estate planning community for at least 20 years. But I believe that this is the first time that conduit trust and accumulation trust, those terms have been written into the official, into the rules as official terms. Um, so a conduit trust is basically a trust that requires all distributions. I'm sorry, I'm managing the slides in here too. So I need, I've got the symbol between my legs and the bass drum on my back, kind of trying to do it all. but. Um, so I apologize if I don't keep up on the slides and get carried away. But a conduit trust is, um, is basically a trust that requires all distributions from the retirement plan to be distributed immediately to a beneficiary or beneficiaries. So that means that all RMDs and any discretionary withdrawals get distributed immediately to the beneficiary. An accumulation trust is any other trust that can qualify as a see-through trust. And basically that means a trust that isn't required to distribute all of its RMDs and any discretionary withdrawals immediately. So for example, a typical marital trust, a Q-tip trust, it might be an accumulation trust. If it, um, you know, you have a mandatory income distribution, but if it allows a discretionary distribution of principal, uh, 
without uh, require without a separate provision, which a lot of trusts have, to require distribution of all retirement plan assets uh, outright. So the proposed regulations confirm that for conduit trusts, it's only necessary to look at the conduit beneficiary to determine whether that beneficiary is a designated beneficiary. Not the non-contingent beneficiaries who survive the account owner, they've got a definition in the regs, they're called tier one beneficiaries. So like the conduit beneficiary is what you call the tier one beneficiary. And then the proposed regulations define another class, tier two beneficiaries. Those are the people who take at the death of tier one beneficiaries. Um, the proposed regulations provide that for accumulation trusts, you get to ignore any beneficiary whose interest is conditioned on the death of a tier two beneficiary. So just to boil this down, what does this mean? Why is it my favorite part? So generally speaking, the takers in default in a trust and other remote beneficiaries, they don't have to be considered anymore. And that's a relief. So because for example, you might have a charity named as a remote beneficiary in a trust agreement. Um, and it used to be a, a big concern that having a charity named in the back of a trust um, could, could basically cause your trust not to qualify as a see-through trust and be a designated beneficiary. And that would suck you into that old five-year RMD rule. And it's actually still the five-year RMD rule if you don't have a designated beneficiary. So if that isn't great enough, that we get to ignore kind of those remote beneficiaries for purposes of deciding whether or not we uh, have a designated beneficiary, the proposed regulations, they go on to provide that the permissible appointees under an unexercised power of appointment, they don't count either when you're identifying the designated beneficiaries. So if you give a beneficiary a power of appointment <clears throat> that can be exercised in favor of a charity <clears throat> or a spouse, um, the charity or the spouse, they don't drag you into this five-year rule either, which used to be a concern because remember to have a designated beneficiary, it has to be an identifiable class of individuals and a spouse is just a generic person who might be older or might be younger. <clears throat> um, but that was always a concern that if you gave somebody a power of appointment that could be exercised in favor of somebody who wasn't identifiable, that now you don't have identifiable individuals and you didn't have a designated beneficiary and so you had this five-year rule apply. Um, if the power of appointment isn't exercised before the beneficiary determination date, that's another defined term. It means September 30th of the year following the death of the account owner. If, you, if the power isn't exercised in favor of one of these ineligible people, um, then you get to ignore the power of appointment and you just look through to the takers and default uh, as if that power wasn't going to be exercised. So to me, this is the best news about the proposed regulations. It wasn't expected, I don't think, or it certainly I don't think it was necessary to implement the SECURE Act. Um, powers of appointment are extremely common. The typical trust for a child grants a power of appointment that can be exercised in favor of some non-identifiable person like a spouse or to charity. Um, and before these regulations, we would often default to using conduit trusts, or we would include somewhat elaborate or restrictive carve-outs for accumulation trusts so that uh, powers of appointment would result or wouldn't result in requiring a five-year payout. So now we should be able to use accumulation trust much more comfortably without upending our typical trust terms to accommodate uh, the RMD rules. So I give the Treasury uh, five stars for including those provisions in the proposed regulations, and I appreciate them making my life a little easier uh, with that. Now, um, as an aside, you know, I the unfortunate thing about doing this in a webinar format, not getting to pull people and ask you all questions as well, I kind of wonder if, if my options are basically getting a 10-year payout versus a five-year payout, how much incentive is there anyways in order to get the 10-year payout instead? Does it make that much of a difference to people? I'd be curious to hear what other people think about that, how, how willing they are to bend over backwards um, to try to get a 10-year distribution period instead of a five-year period. Um, so that's what I consider to be the most important point. The fact that RMDs uh, have to be taken during years one through nine and also 10 during the 10 year uh, drawdown period for, for a lot of people. And then my favorite point, the fact that we get to ignore a lot of those remote beneficiaries and powers of appointment for uh, evaluating accumulation trusts as designated beneficiaries. The proposed regulations clarify several additional questions created uh, and, and that were left open by the SECURE Act. So first, the regulations affirm that if the account owner dies or died before the effective date of the SECURE Act and had one designated beneficiary, 
after that designated beneficiary's death, the 10 year rule is going to apply. So if there are multiple beneficiaries of a see-through trust, and um, if there are multiple beneficiaries of a see-through trust and the life expectancy of the oldest beneficiary is being used, then if the oldest beneficiary dies after the effective date of the SECURE Act, then the 10 year rule applies after the death of the oldest beneficiary. If the oldest beneficiary died before the effective date of the SECURE Act, then the SECURE Act rules don't apply uh, in that instance. The second point I've got, um, for purposes of applying the statutory effective date, if the account owner died before the effective date and the spouse is the beneficiary, then the spouse is treated as the account owner. And then if the spouse dies after January 1st of 2020, but the designated beneficiary died after the effective date, then the SECURE Act rules uh, would apply to the beneficiary of the spouse's designated beneficiary. So basically, you know, um, the way the regulations work is they're putting the designated beneficiary of somebody who died before the act, or they're putting the, the designated beneficiary of a spouse who uh, inherited before the effective date of the SECURE Act, they're putting that person in sort of as the, in the role of an eligible designated beneficiary who's still getting to take over their life expectancy, but at whose death the tenure rule applies now to the next beneficiary in line. Um, the proposed regulations, they expressly permit amendments, reformations, modifications uh, of trusts before the beneficiary determination date to add or remove beneficiaries. So, uh, you know, if there's a need to modify a trust to change who the beneficiaries are in order to get them all to be eligible designated beneficiaries, for example, you know, that can be done before September 30th of the year following the account owner's death. Um, and the, the regulations expressly provide for that, which is a handy change. Um, the, let's see, the proposed regulations, they provide for disregarding a beneficiary of a see-through trust when entitlement is conditioned upon the death of an individual that has not reached the age of majority. If the terms of the trust provide for full distribution by the later of the end of the 10th year, the 10th calendar year following the account owner's death, or by the end of the 10th year in which the beneficiary attains 21, so 31. So basically, um, you know, you get to treat it as a see-through trust if it's going to terminate, if it's for, um, for a minor, if it's going to terminate by the time that they turn 31. You get to ignore the other remote beneficiaries. The proposed regulations also provide for an exception of an accumulation trust to treat a minor child as an EDB, as long as the trust distributes by the time the minor turns 31. The proposed regs use the example that if the trust has the spouse as the beneficiary and at the death of the spouse, the minor children are the beneficiaries, um, that also is an exception. If, uh, and if the trust for the minor child only holds the trust until the child attains the age of 31, then that trust will also be an EDB. The trust will qualify to pay out over the life expectancy of the spouse. So if you name the spouse first and the remainder beneficiaries are children and they're minor children, you, uh, they, the minors are EDBs, the spouse is also an EDB, you get to use the spouse's life expectancy. Um, the definition of the age of majority has been defined in uh, the new regs. They've defined it as 21. The current rule says something to the effect of, you know, if they're 26 or under and pursuing a course of study, um, and the treasury said that that was gonna be um, that, that it was too difficult for plans to have to keep track of who's studying or who's not studying and, and what does that mean. And they came out in favor of just a simpler rule. Um, for plans that are already have the other rule in place, they can continue to use it. But, um, but they have just said, if you're 20, under 21, then you are a minor. Um, and during your, the period of minority for a beneficiary, they get to use the minor's life expectancy when they turn 21, has to be distributed within 10 years of that. Remember one of the categories was uh, disabled beneficiaries as eligible designated beneficiaries. So they provided a definition of disability. It's based on whether the individual's uh, unable to engage in substantial gainful activity. Uh, there's another special definition given for people who are under the age of 18 um, because it can be hard to apply the rule about engaging in gainful activity for somebody who's a, a minor. Um, that applies a comparable standard 
It requires the beneficiary to have a medically determinable uh, physical or mental impairment that results in marked, marked or severe functional limitations that could be expected to result in death or to be long continued and indefinite in duration. Um, so the proposal regs clarified that the determination of disability has to be made as of the account owner's date of death. So if you have a minor child who is not disabled, but is disabled before they become uh, an adult, so before they turn 21 under these rules, they actually don't count as being uh, disabled for purposes of becoming an eligible designated beneficiary. They have to be disabled, qualify as disabled at the time of the account owner's death. So that is one of the things sort of strange clarified by the regulations. Um, there is also um, some guidance about what it means to be chronically ill in, um, in the new regulation. It's similar to qualifying for, as being chronically ill for a long-term care contract. Um, you have to be unable to perform two activities of basic daily living, eating, toileting, transferring, bathing, dressing, or uh, being continent. Um, and it has to be indefinite or reasonably expected to be lengthy. It can't be uh, just for a short period of time and it has to be certified as well. So they've given clarification on how to determine um, if somebody is disabled and also chronically ill. They've provided guidance uh, for multi-beneficiary trusts. So there's a type of trust that they call a type one applicable multi-beneficiary trust. And the terms provide that the trust is to be divided immediately upon the death of the account owner into separate trusts for each beneficiary. And then there's um, a type two multi-beneficiary trust. Um, and basically it provides that there's no individual other than a disabled or chronically ill designated beneficiary has any right to the uh, to the account until the death of all of them. Um, and basically the regs provide that as long as you've got, um, you, you can't have a trust that separates immediately a type one trust, but then also for uh, the type two trust that you get to ignore all the remainder beneficiaries um, for purposes of deciding if the trust is a see-through trust that gets to use the life expectancy of the eligible designated beneficiaries. As long as all of the beneficiaries are eligible designated beneficiaries, nobody else can be a taker um, until all of them have died. Uh, one issue to look out for here is that occasionally you do see special needs trusts that, um, that basically give the trustee the power to terminate the trust early. If, for example, um, the trust isn't satisfying its purpose of, of excluding the beneficiary's assets, um, from the reach of creditors, they might go ahead and just terminate the trust early. Um, that kind of trust wouldn't qualify here for the life expectancy distribution payout uh, because it could potentially terminate before the death of all of the uh, disabled or chronically ill beneficiaries. Um, something that came up for me recently in which folks are gonna complain about, I think is part of the comments, on these proposed regulations is the RMD period for beneficiaries after the owner reached their RBD. So if the owner named the designated beneficiary, then the designated beneficiary is gonna be subject to that 10 year rule. And they're gonna to have to take the distributions if the proposed regs end up being the final regs in years one through nine, and then also in 10. But if the owner didn't name a designated beneficiary, so if it's just blank or if they've named their estate, then the RMD period is the owner's remaining actuarial um, life expectancy. This is if they've died after their RBD. So for somebody who's 72 years old, I think that number is something like 17 years. So naming the estate as the beneficiary could actually, actually in some instances allow for a longer RMD period. So we'll see if that issue remains in the final regulations or if they try to fix that or clean it up. Um, I'm going to just hurry up and go through some of the Secure Act 2.0. I think we've got about five minutes more that we can spend uh, before we turn to some of the questions here. Actually, let me check the questions. Um, one quick question I, I think I can answer. Um, you know, what, what do you do if you've amended a trust to comply with the Secure Act and then these regs are passed, do we have to amend it again? Um, I guess it depends on the amendment that you've made to the, to the trust. Um, 
you know, the, the regulations basically say that if you make good faith efforts to comply with the regulations, that until they're final, or if you made good faith uh, uh, efforts to comply with the rules until these regulations are made final, you know, you should be protected by that. The fact that the um, IRS publication 590, for example, didn't, it said expressly that you didn't have to take distributions in years one through 10, uh, that you just had to take them by the end of year 10. Um, I would hope that that would be something that somebody could rely on for this year and last year. Um, but, you know, I guess it depends on what you've done to amend your agreement. Um, for example, if you've amended it in some way, but to create a multi-beneficiary eligible designated beneficiary account, uh, but, but, you know, haven't said that it lasts until the death of all of them, like I, I mentioned on that last point about disabled, a trust for all disabled or chronically ill people, um, I think you would need to go amend it again. Um, so let me go ahead and cover some of the Secure Act 2.0 information. So Secure Act 2.0 on March 29th, the House voted uh, 514 to 5 to pass this uh, bill. It's currently in the Senate. I think the Senate will hear it later in the year. Um, I haven't heard anything recently about uh, the Senate taking any action on it. Um, so let's see. First, you have mandatory automatic enrollment um, under the new Secure Act 2.0. Um, the default rate is between 3% and 10%. Um, there's an automatic escalation of 1% per year up to 10%, but no more than 15%. Employees can affirmatively elect a different contribution um, and certain plans are gonna be accepted. The Senate version doesn't have this automatic enrollment feature in it yet. Um, they're looking at increasing the RBD. So right now the Secure Act, like I said, has an age of 72. The House has proposed increasing it um, kind of gradually over time. 73 this year, 74 and 2029, 20, 75 and 2032. The Senate version just has 75 and 2032. Um, there are inflation adjustments for the IRA catch-up. Currently, there's no inflation adjustment for uh, the $1,000 catch-up contributions to IRA, IRA account owners uh, who are 50 and above. But the House Act adjusts the IRA catch-up for inflation starting in 2023. Um, so the Senate would would, you know, they have rounding differences, but basically there will be an inflation catch up um, if it were to pass. Let's see, the part-time owners or part, excuse me, part-time employees, the eligibility to participate in a 401k, it would be reduced um, from three years to two years. There would be a lost and found database, which is really interesting created, you know, so for people who have little retirement accounts out there where they used to work, 401k account that didn't get rolled over when they left their job, there'll be a lost and found database for people to be able to find, um, find accounts that they haven't kept up with. There is a one-time qualified charitable distribution to a split interest entity that would be allowed. It would be a one-time election of up to $50,000 index for inflation for a chari qualified charitable distribution to a split interest entity, such as a charitable remainder annuity trust or annuity trust or charitable gift annuity. Um, there would be employer Roth contributions allowed. So that, that's in the House Act. They would allow employers to match uh, and have those matching contributions be treated as Roth. I presume that the, the employee, of course, would be taxed on that as income, um, so it wouldn't be tax-free for the, the employee, I don't think. Um, there would be no RMDs required for accounts under $100,000, so anybody who has an account with less than $100,000 wouldn't have to take RMDs at all, and the, that's in the Senate Act. And um, the Senate would extend uh, qualified charitable distributions to include distributions from uh, self-employed uh, plans, so SEPs, simple IRAs, 413Bs, and 457B plans as well. So uh, Secure Act 2.0, a lot of uh, taxpayer-friendly options there, it looks like, uh, at least in the drafts that have been circulated. 
um, and also for folks who are um, middle, more lower middle class, middle class folks. Um, the SECURE Act uh, to me is a little bit comical, uh, the name of it, the SECURE Act, um, because it does, you know, not getting the life expectancy stretch anymore does uh, seem to me to not be a terribly middle class uh, friendly tax policy. Um, but I just get to read the rules and interpret them. I don't get to make them. So um, that concludes my part of this presentation. I'm going to look at the questions really quick and see uh, if there are any more that we can answer here live. And if we can't answer one, again, we'll follow up with you. So hold on just a moment while I review these questions. And um, Kyle, did you have any questions on there that were asked that you wanted to answer? Or did you get to them already? I've gotten to most of them. Uh, there was one that's uh, relating to the um, um, investment uh, portfolio income that I uh, need to look into and we'll, we'll get back to you, Alex. Catherine, you've asked how to handle any protected health info with regard to retirement distributions for disabled beneficiaries and required physicians notes. Um, I did not actually, that, that's not in these regulations. I think that's going to be in other regulations. That's going to be more of your HIPAA uh, regulations and things like that. Um, let me check with some of our healthcare people here, Catherine, and get to you after this program too. But that's not covered, I, I don't recall, in these regulations, not specifically. That's a great question. Um, so I'll give people just a minute if they want to ask anything else. So not seeing any more questions, Kyle. Um, it looks like that's all of our questions uh, for today. Um, so as previously noted, please look for an email. Uh, from Williams Mullen this afternoon with a link to the presentation slides as well as the attendance certificate for CPA or CPE, excuse me. And thanks again for joining us today and everybody take care. Have a great day. Thanks.